Hey everybody, I'm Kevin Ioli. Thank you for joining me. UFC 300 is now 24 hours away. It is going to be a huge card. I can't tell you the last time I was this excited for any card, right? I think I have to go back really, and it was just one fight, Mayweather-Pacquiao in 2015, because that fight was kind of like the Ali Frazier of my generation, right? The greatest. So joining me right now, my last guest that I'm going to have on to talk about UFC 300. I saved the best for last. Coach of the year. The best coach in MMA, Eric Nixick from Extreme Couture. Hey, Eric, what's up, bud? Hey, Kev, good to talk to you, man. I'm, I'm, dude, I'm just excited as you are, man. This is such a great card, top to bottom. So I can't wait to break this down with you. And you know, you are lucky that you can sit at home and watch and enjoy the fights. You don't have to uh, work. <laughs> a lot of times when you're working, you don't get, you're in the back, you don't get to see what's going on. Now you can enjoy them. Yeah, hundred percent, man. There, you know, there's some guys that obviously I have ties and connections to, so I'll be pulling for a lot of them, but. Uh, you're right. It's actually it's, it's such a nice time to have the weekend off finally and get to back and sit back and enjoy it as a fan. And no, and no doubt. Well, let's go over. Uh, let's start with the main card and the main event. I think is a is a phenomenal fight. I actually picked Jamal Hill here, uh, and I. I what I did, Eric, so you know, I did a story uh, on KevinIoli.com the other day, and I picked a winner on every single fight. But then a couple of my made bets on. I said, okay, here's my recommended bet. I didn't make it on everyone, but this is one I made a recommended bet. And I took Jamal Hill at plus 120. I just kind of thought if Pajeda was the dog, I would have probably said I, I would bet Pajeda because I think this is such an even fight. But Hill does have that varied game, which I think he's a little better on the ground than uh, than Alex Pajeda is. And so what do you take when you look at that fight? Like, uh, who do you favor? And, and how do how does Jamal Hill get it done? I'm with you, Kevin. And I'll tell you what, um, fortunate enough for me that I'm, I've been able to work with Jamal as a friend. Um, I've, I've held some pads for him. I consider him a, a, a pretty good friend of mine where we start to break down fights, not only for his, his fights, but um, I'll call him and ask him about, you know, when Sean fought Drikas. I've called him for other fights where I just wanted his, his insight on because wow. I, I really trust his vision and what he sees in the striking game, not only the striking game, the MMA game for that matter. But when you really break down Jamal, I'll tell you what, it's his timing on when you release a punch. Let's say, let's use Johnny Walker, for example. He's throwing a jab, and Jamal is timing it so perfectly to come over top of the overhand. It has like an instant annoy, like he's he's clawing and throwing, and everything's countering in motion. But it has to do with timing. Sure. And he's so freaking good at finding those holes and finding those openings. But here's where it's very intriguing for me, Kevin is he does it so well out of both stances. He can mm -hmm. he can knock you out with the left hand. He can knock you out the right hand. He can put the right hand forward. He can put the other side. He can kick. He can do all these things. So when you're, when you're looking at handicapping and how are you going to handle this if you're on the betting element, this guy can finish the fight anywhere that he decides to take the fight. And is this guy going to come out and wrestle? Maybe not, but he always has that in his back pocket as well. So it's very intriguing, I think, when you look at it, you break it down. Jamal Hill has more tools in the tool shed to win this fight. So I'm with you. You might as well go with the plus money on that. Exactly. I think that's a fair assessment. You know, Pajeda has that big-time power, and so that's always the game changer, right? You land that one shot, and, you know, and no matter how else the rest of the fight was going, uh, Deontay Wilder used to say, these other guys have to be perfect for 36 minutes. I only have to be perfect for two seconds. There you go. 100%. And that's the great point when you make the assessment between what you just said and Alex Pajeda. And if you go back and watch all of his fights, other than probably Sean Strickland, he's been in some wars, right? He's had to do some figuring out. But to his credit, he's a data collector. Yeah. And the one thing we talked to Jamal about was don't show the same defense over and over because that same defense is a read for Alex Pajeda. If he sees you doing something in repetition, that's where he looks to exploit it. Same thing he did with Sean Strickland. Sean overpairing, overpairing, left a hole for the hook. You know, so his meat potatoes, his basics and fundamentals are world renowned, and he can win a fight off his jab and calf kick alone. And that's that's who he is. But at any moment when he sees a hole in your game, Alex Pajeda can exploit and put your lights out. And that's what he did to Yuri Prohaska in the uh, uh, championship fight at Madison Square Garden. And why, though? Why, though? Because if you remember, I remember breaking that fight down. And I talked to everybody about Yuri Prohaska doesn't bring his hands behind him in the defense. His hands don't come with him. So if he's throwing a hook, 
this hand is down. If he's throwing a hook here, this hand is down. His defense never comes with him. And it didn't take long for Alex Pajeda to notice that and check hook, came right down the middle. He knew when he was throwing that the defense wouldn't be there, and that's what caught him. That punch uh, made a lot of money for Floyd Mayweather. And since Mayweather has been so successful, a lot of other people have followed up and, uh, and done well with that. Co-main event, I think, you know, the least intriguing bout to me on the main card, right? Uh, Zhang Wiley uh, versus uh, Yan Zhaonan for the uh, Strawway Championship. Uh, Zhang Wiley is a, a little better than a four-to-one favorite in this fight. Um, and, and to me, I think, you know, Yan's only had one really high-level performance in in, uh, in her career. And so I, I think, you know, Zhang Wiley maybe in my mind might be a little up and down sometimes. But when she's on, she's on. And I I see her in this fight just kind of cruising. How how do you look at this one? Well, the clearest path to victory, and when you game plan as a coach, you always want to try to find the least evasive path. How do you get there without putting your fighter in any sort of danger? Well, when you go back and watch the Carlo Esparza fight with with Jan, there's a a glaring hole there, and that was in her, not necessarily her wrestling, but her getting up off of her back. Right. She got crucifixed. She got in bad positions and never really had an answer for for getting that pressure up off of her back to relocate into some wrestling transitions. Now, I have to assume when you train under Danny Castillo for the last two and a half, three years, that your wrestling is going to improve, that there's going to be improvements in that game. So that's what I'm looking for to see. But if you're the champ and you feel there's a hole in her game, you have to go out there and test it right away to see if they shored that hole up. And if that's the case, she did, then you have your other routes you can always go to. But right away, I think you get on that wrestling and see if she, uh, she has an answer to that, to that ground game. And she is so physically strong too. I mean, I think that's going to be an advantage for her in the fight. It seemed like Zhang Wiley is the maybe the strongest fighter in that division. And you know, while I don't always put a lot of stock into physical strength, I think in this one she might be able to bully her around a little bit. Completely agree with you. But what do you do if, if you're on the yawn side? You take advantage of somebody that is a bully. And how do you take advantage of it? Is you utilize your footwork. And what I've seen yawn do very well is her pull counter series. So when you have a bully coming forward. You're going to utilize her momentum coming forward and let her walk into some of those power punches. Then we've seen Jan crack. We've seen her hit hard. We've seen her hit those alley crosses and get down that center line. But sometimes if you're moving backwards and you can plant that back foot and keep an anchor back there and let her walk right into that joust stick, a lot of the momentum that Whaley will have coming forward will do the work for you. It goes so look, against her. It goes against her. So Jan really needs to take, take in consideration – of utilizing her footwork and her pull counters, especially if you're going to see Wei Li try to wrestle heavy. You want to keep your footwork in motion so you're never a sitting target. So, you know, I this fight, uh, Justin Gaethje versus Max Holloway for the uh, BMF title, I think it's going to be off the hook crazy. And, you know, I was going to make a recommendation to Dana White and say, you know, retire the fight of the night and call it the Justin Gaethje Max Holloway Award and uh, the, don't – Give them a big amount of money and then let somebody else have a chance to win it. <laughs> Those two fight, it's, uh, forget about it. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I don't have a play on this fight. And I, I think it's a toss-up fight, right? I wanted to say Max Holloway. I ended up in my story picking Gaethje, so I'm going to stick with Gaethje since that's what I said. Uh, but as I've been thinking about it over the last couple of days since I made that pick, I'm kind of starting to go, man, I wish I had picked Max Holloway. How do you see it? I'm with you. I don't think you even make a pick. I think you sit back and crack the beer open and enjoy the spectacular, you know, fight we're going to see out of these two guys. God forbid if one of them decided to wrestle a little bit and mix in, and mix in some takedowns, you know, it's going to happen. But um, with that being said, I definitely think it would favor Max considerably if he were able to wrestle a little bit. It's not there's a weakness in Justin Gaethje's wrestling. There's a weakness of on his back. And admittedly so, he said that. If you could put Justin on his back, he has a little bit of trouble there. Now, it just adds another element to your striking game if somebody has to worry about the takedown. Not saying over-wrestle, but right. make him consider it. They can put him on his back a little bit. Max needs to fight this fight on, on angles. He needs to fight this fight on 45-degree angles and not get directly in front of the car crash. Don't get, Don't be in front of the car crash because that's where Justin Gaethje is his best. He wants you in the phone booth. He wants to crack your legs. He wants to throw tight elbows, uppercuts, hooks, things like that. He does very rarely throws straight punches, right? So he wants that that fight grimy. Now, Justin Gaethje will have the reach advantage by one inch, 
because when, I think when you see Max, you think long and tall, but he's now moving up a division. Right. So when you have a guy like Max who can hit from both stances, strike out of both stances, then you, you're you able to do so many things with movements and angles where you can fight this fight on 45 degrees and stay out of the stay out of the damage that you're going to accrue if you stay right in front of Justin Gaethje. Are, are Gaethje's kicks going to be a factor in this one, do you think? Absolutely, because if you go and break down the Volkanovski fights, especially in the beginning, what did Volkanovski do? He took away a lot of the movement by chopping that lead leg. So why do I say Max needs to move it in and out of stances? Because you don't want to have a stationary target with your lead leg. You want to move it a little bit. But not only do you want to move it, you want to expect them to, you know, if we fought a guy who used a lot of movement or predicated on movement, the kicks would still be a live play because you're going to try to go inside, outside, low kicks. But with that being said, you also have to make sure you're not just standing there just right in front of them and trading those kicks. We saw when Justin Gacy fought Edson Barboza. They welcomed that that chaos right there. Right. They started banging those low kicks, right? And then what happened? Justin Gaethje started finding his hooks, and he got right and tight, and then that's when the fight was over. So um, I think it's best for him to, to, to stay on that on that length. You know, you, uh, you're you in the arenas, and you're up close like I am uh, all these fights. And, you know, to me, for people who have never been there and you're watching it on TV, when there's some of those leg kicks, it sounds like a baseball, a, a double to the wall or something. I mean, those things are so loud, and they resonate that uh, like I just don't know how guys take those kicks. <laughs> Oh, unreal. I mean, Brendan Allen landed some nice kicks on, on Chris over the weekend. And Chris one arm blocked a couple of those. I'm like, bro, get two hands over there, man. Those things are, those things are baseball bats, you know, because you can break an arm by just uh, throwing that one up. hundred percent. Another one. Uh, I have Charles Oliveira winning two bonuses on this show, right? Uh, Charles, there's, I did some research the other day, Eric, and there is 130 bonuses among the 25 fighters on the card who fought in the UFC before. Kayla Harrison obviously did not. Uh, Max Holloway has 19 of those 100. Wow. Max Holloway, excuse me, Charles Oliveira has 19 of those 130 uh, bonuses. Wow. That is freaking unbelievable. Uh, he even has a knockout of the night. That's uh, you go back. He has it all on there. Uh, he's going up against Armand Sarukian. Sarukian is the favorite here, and and I I had a play of a dollar eighty five plus uh, one eighty five on Charles. To me, Charles is a much more well rounded fighter. I th- I guess they're looking at the wrestling and figuring that uh, Sarukian is probably going to uh, uh, out wrestle Charles. But Charles has faced a lot of a lot of wrestlers before, and a lot of people want to go on the ground with Charles. Right. But Charles seems like he has a little bit of everything to his game. I, I, I think he wins it. How about you? I love that pick. Um, and you can make an argument for both sides. But I'm with you in that regard because I almost feel in some ways that the, the wrestling might negate one another due to the wrestling versus submission game. Um, and if this turns into a striking contest, I definitely lean towards Charles Oliveira just because of his range and his improvements in the striking game. But I also do feel like Armin Sarukian's is confident enough in his ground game to follow him to the ground, to take him to the ground. But that's what's in consideration of understanding what you're doing and where are you doing this at. We've seen guys take Charles Oliveira down, but what the key to this is, Kevin, you got to get into half guard. You don't want to play a full guard with a guy like Charles Oliveira. You want to isolate a bottom leg, but even better if you could do it against the barrier. You want to take him down against the cage so you have something there to control his back you need to lace a leg up, and then that's when you can actually get good ground and pound involved. So we've seen Michael Chandler do it. We've seen some other guys do it in the past. We've seen Paul Felder do it. We've seen guys. So the, the blueprint has been there. But most recently, we saw Islam Makachev go, I can take this guy down, and I can put him on his back, and I can go pass guard, and I can power pass and do all those things. So when you talk about guys in this sport, you talk about their egos. And I feel like Armin Sarukian has a big ego with the confidence to back it up, right? Like he can go do this and feels like, hey, if I take this guy down, I have the right routes to understand how to nullify some of that jujitsu. The problem with that is, is Charles Oliveira is probably the best we've ever seen in submission, transitional submissions. On the get-ups, on the cage, on this, on that. In that moment, there's a, a, a get-up or a release of pressure Guess what, man? That front headlock series is going on, the Darces, the guillotines. So do you want to risk some of that? That's where I'm really – I'm just so excited to see the game plans between these two great coaches and see what they come up with. And that's going to be a wild fight. 
Uh, the middleweight bout uh, that opens up the main card, uh, getting a lot of criticism, uh, Bo Nickel, who I think you're going to be coaching against before too much longer, uh, <laughs> against Cody Brundage. Uh, you can't bet this fight. Uh, Bo Nickel, I think, was one up this morning. I saw minus 2,500. So, you know, you can't wow. – really, unless, unless you believe Cody Brundage is going to win the fight, then then you make it and play on Cody Brundage. But you, I don't see how you bet Bo Nickel uh, in this situation. But um, – you know, Bo Nickel, I, I think everybody is basically saying this guy is already one of the elite uh, grapplers in the world and that, that his striking is good enough that he can deal, you know, with somebody of the ilk of uh, Cody Brundage. How, uh, how good do you think Nickel is now and how good do you think he is going to be after, say, two or three more fights? Uh, I think sky's the limit for this kid, not only because of his pedigree, but when you go and watch um, the Val, I don't remember the kid's last name, but you watch the way that, yes. So you got to, you got to understand what you're looking at in the detail. Bo Nickel chains his level change and his striking and his wrestling perfectly. It's not a la carte. You don't see the boxing and then you don't see the, Oh, now I'm going to wrestle. Everything has a movement to it that the whole time your their opponent is guessing. And the way that they're, the way that he's being coached and the way that whoever's putting this together for him, Mike Brown, I got to assume, is, is, is absolutely genius to keep him where pedigree and reputation will always be on his side, and that's the takedown. But what makes it so freaking hard to understand what's coming at you is when you blend it in with your level change. So when he came out and level changed and threw that big hook and landed on Val, I was like, oh, this kid is good because now he's understanding that I have the reputation and pedigree, and if I show level change, people better respect it. And if they don't, I'm going to crack him or I'm going to take him down. Yeah, he is something else. How far away do you think he is from being able to, you know, there was talk, uh, you know, or at least he initiated talk about fighting Hamzat. Um, you know, Hamzat has a win over the former welterweight champion Usman, so he's obviously a highly regarded guy. There have been talk of him fighting some of the top guys. Michael Bisping the other day called him, said he could be the American Habib. Um, do you think that's, you know, overstating it? Right now. I think that the potential is, is certainly there. And I think Cody Brundage is a formidable foe in this fight. I think it's the right step up of, of, of opponent. We've seen Cody Brundage um, in some adversity and, and being able to find the knockout and, and catch guys. Right. Um, but you know, Hey, you get past this test with Cody Brundage. Then there's a, there's the guys right outside the top 15. I don't see why you try to rush this kid. Um, when, when, when really he doesn't have a lot of tread on the tires. Right. You know, collegially, yes, he has, but he hasn't had this long MMA career where he's taken a lot of damage. So I, I think maybe even after, if he if he gets past Cody Brundage, give him another two or three fights outside of the top 15 because, you know, as a business, try to collect as many wins and paychecks as you can to get onto those good contracts. So by the time you're fighting these guys in the top 15, you're making some good money. Yeah. Well, there yeah. you go. Yeah, that makes – Sean Strickland managed to get himself paid, uh, uh, so that was good news. Show me the money. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go over a few. I, I, I'm cognizant that you don't have a hell of a lot of time, so we'll go over uh, only a couple of the uh, undercard fights. Uh, and The one that I think, you know, a fight off of the main card, if I take a fight off the main card that I think has a chance to be fight of the night, Yuri Prohaska versus Alexander Rakic. Um Rakic I'm concerned about because he's coming off a two-year layoff. Now, there was something that um, that Yuri Prohaska said the other day that shocked me, which was that he trained for only one week against Alex Pajeda in um, in November when they fought at Madison Square Garden. Now, that could be, hey, he lost the fight, so, you know, you got to have an excuse. But that was interesting to hear given that he had that, you know, really bad shoulder injury. Uh, a, do you agree with me that – of the preliminary card fights, that's the best one that has a chance of being fight of the night. And and number two, Rakic is the favorite. Are you surprised by that? I'm really not because I think what we've seen out of Alexander Rakic since um, he's been in the UFC has been nothing but fireworks. You know, the, his dismantling of Anthony Smith and, and guys where you're like, man, you know, those unfortunate knee injuries that, that happen in this, in this game – um, it reminded me of when Tom Aspinall got hurt. I remember telling, I remember writing Tom and just saying like, Hey man, injuries happen for a reason. I don't know what it is, 
But, you know, it's one of those things like the universe is, is wanting to see you get through some sort of adversity outside of the cage. And sometimes guys come back better for it and from it. So, yes, it's, it's hard because you haven't seen what's been going on with him for the last two years. But one would have to assume that this guy is going to come back sharp and ready to go. And if it's the same Alexander Rash as we've seen in the past, again, I love Yuri and I love what he's capable of. But there's so many holes and flaws within his defense that I think that a guy like a striker as, as clean as Alexander might be able to find a finish in that fight. Um, and then there's always the thing where I've seen with with uh, with Yuri has been just his takedown defense, man. He's, he starts to overthrow, gets front foot heavy. And that, that takedown's there. And we saw what Alexander was able to do against a guy like Anthony Smith, who's very, very good on the ground. He was able to nullify him and, and get a lot of ground to pound in, especially with the guy with long extremities. So I, I, I definitely understand why he's the favorite, although we haven't seen him in two years. Hey, I, I think Yuri's kind of like a dust devil, right? He's just all over the place. And to me, you know, I actually picked Yuri to win the fight. And the reason I did was I thought he throws from crazy angles, angles that guys don't see out of him, rackets being a kickboxer that, you know, you're expecting the, the shots to Clean. come a certain way, right? And now all of a sudden it's coming somewhere else. And and to me, that was uh, that was the my reason for, and, and also the plus money. But, uh, yeah, you know, I, I like to play the underdogs when I think the fights are close. And you're not wrong. You're not wrong in that assessment by by any means. Here's a here's an interesting point: is like, who do you get to spar to look like Yuri Prohaska? There's no one that can spar like him or give you that look. And I remember talking to Alex Bejeda's coach about it, um, and I'm thinking like, man, you have to keep your defense up two seconds longer than you actually think you're supposed to, because once you th- see something go by, you think it's your turn. Here comes a spin. Here comes an elbow. Here comes a wheel kick. Here comes something that you're not really accustomed to seeing because of that cleanliness of striker that both, you know, Alex Bejeda and Alexander Rakic are. So I'm with you on that, man. You can get caught in that just kind of mesmerized by watching what he does. Real quick, just like say 10 seconds on this one. Now, what do you expect out of Aljamain Sterling? Man, um, he's had an unbelievable camp. And, you know, it's a guy that like I consider a teammate. He's in our gym a lot. I'm with him on drill session days. I'm with him on sparring days. Um, uh, we kind of talked about, you know, me being in the corner, elected not. That was kind of the situation because I'm so close with Tyson and Calvin. It just didn't make a lot of sense for me. Um, but I'm definitely, in my heart, I'm definitely pulling for Aljo because of the sweat equity that I've had on the mats with him. This is going to be a tough test. And, we're, and, and by no means is anybody overlooking uh, Calvin Cater. And I know, I know for a fact Aljamain is not. Um, you're talking about a 91% takedown um, defense in, yeah. in, in Calvin Cater. Um, I know what I had to do when we game planned him against Dan Ige, and it was no easy task. And it took a lot of, lot of, lot of, hey, how are we going to get this job done? And Calvin wins fights on very, very beautiful, clean, precise striking and fundamentals. So if by any means he sees a hole in any of Aljamain's striking, Man, it could be a long night for Aljo, but if Aljo can find that backpack series that he's so, so freaking great at, and I see it day in and day out, Kev, it's just a problem. So if this, if the crowd is booing, Aljamain is winning, yeah. right? If, if, if Aljamain is staying on his kicks and his movement and his faint game and can kind of confuse and then nullify some of those takedowns or get those takedowns and nullify some of Calvin's striking just by hanging on him and backpacking, it might not be the most exciting fight, but that's the fight Aljamain Sterling needs to have to win. You know, I think to me, I'm calling this the Martin Luther uh, King Jr. fight for Aljamain Sterling. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last to 135 pounds because yeah. he doesn't have to make that weight. And I yeah. think he, I said this to Dana White the other day, and he he agreed with me. I said, not only was Sterling massive for a band white, I think he is going to be one of the biggest featherweights in the division. And so the fact that, you know, he's going to come out now and he's had that extra 10 pounds and doesn't have to kill his body to get down there. Boy, I'll tell you what, I, I think that's going to be a difference for him. So the room that we have, the guys that we train with on Wednesdays is Aljamain Sterling, Jeremy Kennedy, a big featherweight, Dan Ige, Kai Kamaka, Julian Arosa, and Cody Stamen, who could probably be a featherweight, right? So the group that we get together with and work quite a bit with that are at 145, they're all pretty big 145ers, and Aljamain is is just just as big or bigger than most of them that we have on the map. Yeah, 
That does not shock me. And Lance Palmer. Don't forget Lance, Lance, Lance Palmer. Palmer as well. That big old galoot. So, you know, these guys cut a lot of weight to get to 45, and Aljamain looks big against them. Okay, so I'm going to ask you about two more fights, and we'll wrap. So, sure. um, and then, and, and and I also at the end, I want to ask you about the new gloves if you've had a chance to look at yeah. that. Uh, very quickly on Kayla Harrison, uh, I, I have been bullish on Kayla, uh, but I saw her at the weigh in today, and I don't know if that's any little concern to uh, if you're reason to be concerned. Did you see her? I, I, so I saw she made weight, and then I was in the cage, and one of the guys says, Did you see Kayla? And I said, I didn't, I saw she made weight and they showed me the picture or showed me the video. Yeah. And I, right away, it was alarming. It was a little alarming health concern wise. Um, so immediately what goes through my mind, if Holly Holm can make it out of round one, she might be able to get this fight done. She might be able to win this fight off of her, her length yeah. and, and keep this, keep this at arm's length, just the same way she did with Ronda. This might be Kevin. This might be another Holly Holm and Ronda Rousey fight if mm. she can make it out around one, due to the fact of a massive weight cut and see what happens with her cardio. Yeah, Kayla, Kayla fought at one seventy two in the Olympics, and now here we are. I, I, and you know, I actually I didn't tell this story, but in Rio, I actually bumped into her. Press conference was over, and she was leaving, and I was going this way. I had to get to the tennis uh, venue. That's like at the Olympics. You cover everything, right? So I'm leaving judo. I'm going to the tennis, and I bumped into her, and I thought I hit a brick wall. I literally thought I had a brick wall, and she you know, she was 107. Well, she probably weighed more than that at that point, right? But um, yeah. a big, strong woman, and cutting down. I mean, God bless her for doing it. I mean, that, that was something else. And she told me the other day, Eric, that I thought was interesting. She said, really, it started just – she changed what she ate. She said it, it was like she loved pizza and she loved bread and, and stuff like that. And she said she quit eating that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden the weight started coming off. So it's smart. And you know what, Kev, to, to your credit with, I've held pads for her before. And Ali had specifically asked me, I want MMA pads for her, which means we're going to include some takedowns. We're going to include some ground and pound. So I had her on top throwing elbows and violent punches and hitting hard yeah, man, she's as advertised and she's mean and she's grimy when she gets in those positions. The one thing that I'm very curious about, what happens when you add elbows to her game, yeah. right? Unfortunate she wasn't be able to elbow in the PFL. Just and Invicta. People, and just Invicta. So, you know, when, when I remember people criticizing Lance Palmer when we were in the PFL because of his ground and pound. Well, you took away two of his best assets and that's right elbow and left elbow when it comes to ground and pound. So I'm very curious to see what she does in the adaptation of the new rules for her, which is just mainly adding in elbows. But that will add such a high element when it comes to ground and pound because you can still stay sticky on somebody and inflict damage without giving up a lot of control. Yeah. Last one I want to ask you about uh, the opener. Uh, I am really high on Cody Garbrandt, and maybe I'm a sucker. You know, uh, everybody else is on uh, Figueredo. Figueredo is minus 310. Uh, Cody is plus 250. I actually advised a play on Cody. Not not only did I pick Cody, but I said I'm going to uh, put my money down on Cody at plus, at plus 250. I can never forget the guy that beat Dominic Cruz. And if Cody is near that, to me, that is like, that is hard. And and he, I just thought that Brian Kelleher fight, it looked like a different person. And maybe I, maybe I'm making too much of it. And I know Brian Kelleher is not the same fighter that Davidson Figueredo is. But boy, oh boy, I'm high on Cody Garbin. Am I wrong? No, no, you're not wrong. And this is a this is a friend of mine. This is a guy that I train with a ton. And Cody Garbrandt is a guy that if his body starts to fail on him, his mind follows. But if he's in shape and his back is okay and his body's okay, then his 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 skill set follows behind it. I can't tell you how many times in conversations I've had with Cody where I've said, Hey, when's the last time you watched your Dominic Cruz fight? And he's like, oh, well, I, you know, I don't know. I go, go back and watch that fight and remind yourself who and what you're capable of. Yes. Because th there's a different there's a different guy that I know that's able to go out and execute and when you're confident in your skill set. So I, I'm with you. I'm very high on Cody. Uh, I'm pulling for him in this fight. I do think that he is very undervalued. I don't think the line should be that far off. Because if, if, if Cody Garbrandt can get going early and gain his confidence early – and the fight turns into where he's – and his best attribute is his vision. Right. I'm telling you what. 
If you if you give this guy a, a four or five piece combination, he's gonna screw it up every time. Yeah. But if you let the guy flow and be creative in what he's able to do with his eyes, he's one of the best in the game. I'm telling you, Kevin. I'm with you, man. I, I'm high on him. He can he can wrestle if he needs it. He can anti wrestle if he can need it. He has the speed. He has the power. So you know, I'm looking forward to him go out and shine on the first five of the night. It's going to be a fun show. Last thing before we let you go, because you are so good at this. Uh, the UFC announced new gloves today um, and it aimed at, you know, I think uh, reducing eye pokes uh, would be one of the big things. A lot of people thought they were going to go uh, with Trevor Whitman's gloves, which I, I don't think would have been a bad idea. But uh, they, they had these gloves in development for five years. I'm sure you got a chance to uh, look at it. Uh, what's your take? And do, you, and do you feel there's any obvious concerns from a coaching standpoint? Uh, nothing yet. It'll be interesting because I usually wrap most of my guys' hands and I use I've I, I was taught a formula by Stitch Duran, so it has a little bit more of an MMA wrap to it. So I'm interested to see kind of how that wrap will mold inside the glove. But I like the curvature to it where it's going to kind of keep your fingers pointed down. We saw Bellator do that years ago, and I think it really helped out. The guys that were Bellator seemed to like the gloves that they had. So, um, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing how guys feel, hit some pads with it and check it out. But they look good. They look sleek. And as long as these guys, their hands are protected – but moreover, we're not seeing the, the eye pokes that we saw in the Weidman fight and everything else. I think it's going to make a significant difference and hopefully eliminate some of those eye pokes. Duncan French, uh, the director of the PI, said today uh, that the gloves are lighter than, you know, than, than they were uh, before and that they're going to require less in terms of tape on your hands. So if that's the case, I mean, I, I got to think knockouts are going up. They said that that's not what they tried to do. But I got to think if that's the case, that there's going to be uh, these are going to be what boxers would call the Reyes gloves, the puncher gloves. That's right. But, you know, when you think about that, my main concern also will go to the fact of uh, are we going to break more hands? Right. A guy's hands going to get broken. I don't know. I don't know. And, and you're absolutely right. Time will tell. But if this is something like you're, you know, you're, you're given a little over here to eliminate some of the eye pokes, but we're going to see more knockouts or more uh, broken hands. You know, I, I don't know. So. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing them. I'm looking forward to, you know, one of the guys getting them on and taping up and, and see how, the, how they feel. Awesome. Eric Nixick, the coach of the year. In my mind, the best coach in MMA. Do a great job. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate you, brother. My pleasure, Kev. I have a good weekend, my man. Are you going to PFL tonight? Uh, I'm going to slap fighting. So we All right, man. I'll see you. <laughs> Take All care, right. brother.